Hello, and welcome to the theory and background section regarding TGA. Uh, the first thing to cover is what is TGA? What is the technique? Um, TGA stands for thermogravimetric analysis. You can get an idea about what the technique does by studying the name. So thermo meaning heat, uh, gravimetric regarding the, the measurement of the mass and analyzing the results. So this technique measures the, the mass change, either positive or negative, and the rate at which it occurs as a function of temperature time and what atmosphere it, it's in. So we can do it in nitrogen, which is an inert atmosphere, or we can do this in air, which would be an oxidizing atmosphere. We use this technique to determine like product uh, composition and how stable it is at, at different temperatures. Uh, we also can characterize any material that exhibits uh, a weight change due to um, absorption and desorption of volatiles. If it decomposes, oxidizes, or even reduces, we can see that change using this technique. So what can we learn from this technique? As I just mentioned, we can learn how stable materials are at different temperatures. So this is particularly important if the materials are going to end up in a specific environment that might have uh, thermal stress put on it. Um, if you introduce an oxidative environment such as air or pure oxygen as the purge gas, you could see how stable materials are in that specific environment, even other environments not relating to oxidative stability. Um, you can try and use it to uh, deconvolute what what materials are in a multi-component system, such as a, a blend of, of plastics or something like that. Um, you can try and see how long stuff is going to last. You can try and do kinetics on decomposition. Um, and a lot of times it is used for this last bullet point, which is how much moisture and uh, how many, how much leftover volatile content is, is there. So if you did a processing technique using some sort of solvent, either water, acetone, something similar, then you should be able to determine how much by weight of that is left over after your process is complete. There are several reasons why the mass might change in this environment. So the, the main one for the main ones for weight loss are listed here. So decomposition is when the material actually starts to break down chemically. Uh, you're going to get a lot of mass loss there and it's going to definitely depend on if it is in an oxidative or inert atmosphere. Um, so this is a common test type where you do what's called loss on ignition and you run the sample in nitrogen up to about 600 degrees. At that point none of the carbonaceous material should have burned off and then you switch to air, and at which point uh, the, the carbon will oxidize into CO2, and you'll be able to see how much carbon is left. And then at the end of that, you'll be able to see how much is considered inert material. Uh, evaporation is, is talking about liquids, uh, anything volatile at an elevated temperature. Um, if you happen to subject your sample to a reduction, a reducing environment such as hydrogen or ammonia, then you would see a, a weight loss related to reduction. And desorption is just if you had a gas or something that was adsorbed into your material, something very porous might have this happen. Um, the, the molecules at the elevated temperature will have enough energy to escape that that pore structure and you'll see the mass loss there. Um, there's only a couple of reasons why you usually get weight gain and it's usually oxidation or absorption. So uh, a common test to see oxidation is the uh, is, is heating up silver. So like a pure silver sample will oxidize in air at elevated temperatures and it will gain mass on the TGA. And then absorption occurs if there is some sort of uh, porous material that might absorb whatever gas or moisture might be in the gas that you're flowing through. Uh, all of these processes are kinetic, so there is a rate at which they occur. And if you do a series of experiments, you could, uh, you could tease out those kinetics. Here's an example of some data that was acquired on a TGA. 
So there are two lines on this plot, one being ran in nitrogen, which is the blue line, and one being ran in air, which is the red dotted line or dashed line. Uh, the, the plot you see is typical. The axes are uh, weight percent on the y-axis versus temperature on the x-axis. So typically we do a weight percent so that you can compare samples without having to so precisely mass out your sample every time you use the instrument. Um, you can see the difference between these is showing the oxidative stability of the, the polypropylene in uh, versus the inert environment stability. So the onset of degradation is the the parameter that they've marked on the plot. So it increases by over 100 degrees, um, about 150 degrees, if it's not in an oxidative environment. Um, you also get to see your final mass, which is your inert material left behind, is only a few percent. Um, this is related to the thermal stability. Uh, you don't need to have the nitrogen plot on there, but the oxygen or the air plot, the red one, is showing the thermal stability of your sample. So you probably would want to stay well below 250 degrees C in order for your sample not to degrade in a normal air environment. So now that we've gone over some theory and background of the instrument, this is what our instrument actually looks like. Um, it's, it's made by TA Instruments, and the model number is a Q500. So the specifications for this instrument are listed here. Um, this, this is a, a very precise instrument. It has a, a weighing precision of, of one one hundredth of a percent. So maximum mass you can do is one gram, and this is definitely not typical. We're typically around the 10 to 15 milligram range. Uh, the balance that it uses is really, really sensitive with a 0.1 microgram sensitivity. Um, the, the dynamic drift is less than 50 micrograms. This parameter indicates how much the balance drifts over the full temperature range. So our temperature range is ambient temperature up to 1000 C. This baseline dynamic drift indicates that if you heat an empty pan with no contamination all the way up from ambient to 1000 degrees, that you will register less than a 50 microgram change through the balance. Uh, the last time I ran it, I think I had a 26 microgram change on our instrument. So it's, it's very good at, um, at staying stable. And you might think, well, 26 micrograms is going to affect my data, but that's just the empty pan. Once you add on the, the sample mass, um, then the accuracy is, is really high. Uh, so I already mentioned the temperature range. Uh, if you wanted to hold a temperature, it's accurate to within one degree uh, Celsius. And we can change the rate that we heat from a very low number such as 0.1 degrees C per minute to a very high number of 100 C per minute. Uh, typically we run around 10 or 20 degrees C per minute. You want to run slower only if there's uh, maybe two different mass loss events happening at close temperatures and you want to make sure that you can see the separation between those. Um, our auto sampler on our, on our system can hold up to 16 samples, so those can run independently of the operator. So once they're set up, you can have them run for many, many hours without worrying about being there to monitor the whole thing. Now we're going to take a look at the hardware of the instrument. So I showed this image before, and this is the front view of the instrument. There's a few basic parts to this system. Up top here, we have the actual balance unit, which is concealed behind uh, this, this front plate. And we'll look inside there more in a minute. Uh, down here, we have the furnace, which is where the sample is heated. The furnace raises up and down. Over here we have the auto sampler where the samples, the, the pans are loaded up in preparation for running. And then it's hard to see, but here we have the uh, sample hook and the thermocouple for 
grabbing the pans and measuring the temperature. And then here we have the tubing, which introduces the purge gas. And then this tube on the other side is where the gas uh, goes out to the exhaust. If we remove this front plate with these six bolts, then we can get a closer look at the balance. Um, the next step would be to remove these little protective covers here to expose the actual elements inside. Now we're going to break this down pretty slowly, but first we're going to need to know what the parts are that we have going on here. So if you look on the left side here, you'll see where the wire goes down through the tube as well as the thermocouple uh, down below where we've seen it on the exterior. On the right side of the balance, we have a counterbalance pan, which is hung by a tiny little hook. And then I'm gonna draw out this frame here. This is the frame of the balance. Uh, at the top in the front, visible to us on this white circuit board is the infrared LED that is used. And then on the other side, not visible from us, is our two photodiodes that are used as the detectors for the LED. Um, in the middle, on the back, again, not visible, is the little motor, also known as the um, meter balance. And this is what operates the actual balance. Here we have a drawing representative of what you were seeing in the previous image with the LED at the top being split by the little tab that you, again, couldn't see before. And so the, the, the light is split uh, by this tab and, and part of the light goes around the left side and part of the light goes around the right side to the photodiode detector. There are two little detectors on this one board. And so each side is supposed to be getting the same amount of light. And this is what's called the zero null principle, where the motor, which moves the balance left and right and actually tilts it about the center of axis, um, the motor itself uh, will adjust whenever the photodiodes don't have the same amount of light reaching each of the two. So for example, if the balance tilted to the left, as shown here, when we add this little mass, the whole balance tilts, you'll see that the light is now split unevenly. When this happens, the motor will adjust and move it back to the center position. And then the amount of current required for that motor to move that distance is proportional to the mass that was added. Um, this also works if mass is lost, the, the whole balance tilts the other way and the motor will readjust accordingly. Uh, this, this principle gives us a very, very sensitive balance and it's not nearly as uh, pronounced as we've shown it here unless the mass change is drastic and very quick. Usually it's a slower mass change so the balance is constantly adjusting and uh, the, the amounts that it's adjusting are, are quite small and mostly imperceptible by eye if we were able to watch it. Thanks for watching. Feel free to email me any questions at the email on the screen.